Oi, eu sou o Vinícius Machado. Eu tenho que ser sincero e dizer que eu estou bem nervoso. Eu vou entrevistar um dos meus heróis, o Tim Schafer. É difícil falar sobre alguém que você admira tanto, ainda mais alguém com legado como o que ele tem. Ele começou na LucasArts, e junto com o Ron Gilbert e o Dave Grossman, ele fez alguns dos melhores adventures até hoje, os dois primeiros Monkey Islands e Day of the Tentacle. Ele também dirigiu sozinho outros dois clássicos do gênero, Full Throttle e Grim Fandango. O Tim Schafer acabou deixando a LucasArts para fundar a Double Fine Productions, onde ele começou a explorar outros gêneros, como a plataforma em Psychonauts e a mistura de ação com estratégia em Brutal Legend. Quando foi decidido que eu iria entrevistar o Tim, eu não sabia muito bem por onde começar. Eu podia passar horas falando sobre os personagens dele, como Manny ou Maureen, e eu queria falar sobre como o início de Full Throttle consegue, em um pequeno monólogo de 30 segundos, estabelecer toda a premissa e estilo do jogo. Mas eram assuntos demais para o que seriam de 10 a 20 minutos de entrevista. Os jogos dele conseguem combinar inspirações muito diferentes, e ainda assim, entregar uma experiência coesa. Grim Fandango mistura filmes no ar com a arquitetura Art Deco e o Dia dos Mortos Mexicano. Full Throttle mistura os motoqueiros do Sem Destino com os desertos de Mad Max e o protagonista sóbrio de Odimbo. Foi daí que eu tirei a ideia de explorar o processo criativo dele, de identificar coisas interessantes nos jogos dele e transformar em uma única pergunta. Como você faz isso? from a creative uh, point of view, from other titles, especially because you were able to connect these completely different ideas and turn them into, into a cohesive form. Take, for example, Green Fandango, where you have the Art Deco meets uh, Film Noir, meets uh, Mexican Day of the Dead, and Full Throttle's uh, Easy Rider meets Jimbo meets Mad Max. How is that process like? Well, I think, uh, I think of it as being, uh, in our company, as being an inspiration company. Yeah. Yeah. The number one thing that gets us started on a project is just uh, like a, a inspiration, which means something that inspires us, and, uh, and that comes from what we are excited about in the moment. So when I uh, made Griffin Fandango, I really loved. I took folklore in college, and I loved Mexican folklore and Day of the Dead, and I was reading a lot about that. And it just like so many um, really vibrant images come. Um, they talk about the four-year journey of the soul, and I was just like, wow, there's a story about. I use this bowl of blood with a chicken head in it and float around and point in the direction we should walk in. So this sounds so cool. And so having those things in your head. And then I was also reading a lot of uh, hard-boiled crime novels like uh, the, uh, Raymond Chandler and uh, Dashiell Hammett, like type uh, novels. And just so happened I was going through those same things at the same time and just being really interested in both of them. And seeing them kind of collide in my brain in different ways and similar themes here and there, the connections you could make. Um, And that led to just, your, your brain just naturally tries to assemble things, I think. And if you take in a lot of things, and you, and you, you read a lot of books, and you watch a lot of movies, you play a lot of games, your brain just naturally starts to like reform them in your head. So that's where it comes from, it's basically just by pursuing the things that I'm interested in, the things that I like, and, and just going down, following those paths, it eventually leads to your brain putting together one of their own. Okay, so if that makes sense. No, that makes a lot of sense. You actually answered a second question I was going to make for... Uh, no, that's okay. <laughs> I have plenty of questions. Uh, where uh, I wanted to know if uh, during the development of the game, when you're writing and stuff, uh, is there a constant research process for these inspirations? Like, you have mentioned that during Grief and Dangle there was a noir festival uh, at your city and you were going every day to see movies. Like, is it something that, okay, I have the idea, that's enough, or you keep going for more inspiration? I like to, um, it might be just a nervous habit, but I like to, if I'm going to do a game that's set in a certain genre or relies on a certain art style, I, I feel like absorbing every single thing that's in the world like that. For one thing, I don't like, I don't want to just repeat what's already been put out there, I want to like start from wherever the last thing left off in a way, like just like, take it all in, take in every single film noir movie I can. I still haven't seen them, there's many, many great film noir movies to watch and, and books to read, of course, but just filling your brain up with all that stuff is, I think, an important part of the process, process. and it also helps you feel less nervous about not getting any work done in the beginning, because when you first start a project, you're like, blank, blank thing of paper, and you're like, I'm gonna go watch a movie, like, and it makes you feel like you're still getting work done, even though you're not, because sometimes your brain has to, like, 
churn on an idea for a while before it ever comes in. Ainda que a criatividade e a inspiração sejam essenciais para criar alguma coisa, fazer jogos implica em ter prazos, e esses prazos implicam em nem sempre poder passar o tempo que você quer lapidando aquela grande ideia. Ou pior, ter que lutar contra o bloqueio criativo. O time já havia mencionado que tem algumas técnicas para essas situações, então eu pedi algumas dicas. Barf ideas on the page. Just write, write, write. I, uh, the, the thing that I was taught when I was in school is free writing. Free writing, uh, where you, the only rule is you have to keep your pen moving. Even if you don't have any words to say, you just write the same word over and over and over again until you like have. And usually your brain will just start to like make sense if you can't stop. Just write, write, write. And that helps you turn off that part of you that goes like, hmm, I wonder if that's the right way to say that. And, you know, you kind of. Because those are real mo momentum killers. You know, you can stop working. So if you just try and write as fast as you can. Qualquer descrição ou perfil do Tim menciona como ele é engraçado e como ele consegue passar isso para os jogos dele. Faz sentido, já que são poucos os jogos que conseguem fazer o jogador rir bastante, então isso acaba chamando muito a atenção. Mas elogiar só esse aspecto da escrita dele acaba omitindo a habilidade que ele tem de expressar qualquer tipo de emoção no enredo. A escrita criativa do Tim é boa ao ponto dos mundos que ele cria parecerem ser vivos. Não é exemplo melhor do que Rubacava, a cidade onde o segundo capítulo de Green Fandango se passa. Quando se diz que uma cidade e um jogo parecem ser viva, geralmente se fala do ponto de vista de um jogo como GTA, onde existem muitos prédios, muitas pessoas e vários lugares para se explorar. A escala é o fator principal para trazer esse aspecto. Enquanto isso, Rubacava só possui alguns lugares e alguns poucos personagens, mas ainda assim consegue ser um dos melhores exemplos de uma cidade virtual nos jogos. Ainda que aspectos estéticos como a arte, a música e a arquitetura da cidade sejam importantes para atrair o jogador, o maior diferencial de Rubacava é a narrativa construída em volta da cidade. 
Quando Manny chega em Rubacava pela primeira vez, ele logo consegue um emprego em uma lanchonete. Logo após isso, o jogo pula um ano, e podemos ver que Manny construiu um império, sendo dono do próprio cassino que ele construiu no lugar da lanchonete. Esse pulo no tempo é essencial para a narrativa da cidade. Ainda que o Manny tenha passado um ano em Rubacava, o jogador ainda não a conhece, mas ainda assim, em cada lugar e com cada personagem que o jogador interage, ele é tratado como um velho conhecido. Ao invés de sermos apresentados à cidade através de diálogos expositivos, nós vamos descobrindo ela através de pequenos momentos. Vemos que Manny passa horas no cassino relembrando os velhos tempos com seu sócio Glotes, troca flertes com Carla e declama poesias no porto junto com seu amigo Velasco. Juntos agora! Ela abriu, pálida como a morte. E eu ali, entreguei a minha sorte. Fiquei pensando como o mesmo luar. Que meu coração, como a brisa tocou, era aquele que fazia brilhar o Recife, onde ela se espatifou. Tim faz com que o jogador se sinta mais como um velho amigo da cidade do que como um recém-chegado. Well, there's a couple of things. One is really inspired by Casablanca. Casablanca is a, is a town like that where, like, it starts off and, like, uh, when Pierre Laurie is talking to Humphrey Bogart, you can tell they've, they've lived in this town for a long. They know each other. He knows the police uh, uh, chief and, and all these characters with this history. And then new people come in and it sets up this, you know. But that, that game, that, that, that movie is all about the history, the history of Rick and Elsa. Um, So that was one of the inspirations. And then the, the people we're working with, like everybody in Lucas Arts was really into backstory and really into we would get that to organize together so like Peter Chan and everyone would talk about how this town came to be, who are the different characters and what they've been doing over time. And artists like Peter really like to think through the story of what they're drawing. It's not just like it was drawn like it happened, it was all built in one day. It was like, well first there was this part of town and then that was really popular and then it collapsed and then this other part of town. Like if you look at Full Throttle. Here's the town of Melonweed, and it started to sink into the mud. And so they just built buildings on top of all the buildings, you know, and that's something that he likes to think through when he does a story. Even simple things like asking, like, where is this character to go to the bathroom? Like, he thinks about these things and tries to make his environment look like someone actually lives there. And then when you're doing the, the third thing, you're doing the writing, is to try and know what the backstory of the characters and all their relationships to each other is so that you can just jump in um, like people do with these stories and these histories. So you don't start a conversation with someone in town that you've lived in for 20 years by saying, hi, what's your name? Like you start with that, that history. And I think the players can catch up really fast. They can be like, oh, I sense this. None of these two, you know? So you just give the player the benefit of the doubt that they'll be able to figure it out. Figure it out. And it evokes much more. When you, when you talk about a little history, like even just Domino talking about Manny punching him at a Christmas party, like I feel like this, you put little touches like that in, people imagine even more. They imagine much, much more and they fill that in. Os jogos mais famosos do Tim são os seus Adventures. O Adventure é um gênero que se destaca por focar muito em narrativa e exploração, tanto que é raro algum deles possuir algum tipo de combate. Os desafios desses jogos geralmente vêm na forma de quebra-cabeças e problemas de lógica, que são usados para intercalar os momentos da história e cadenciar a narrativa. Os adventures do Tim sempre prezam por ter quebra-cabeças com um propósito na história e que eles ajudem a guiar a narrativa. Mas e quando ele está fazendo um jogo de outro gênero? A narrativa continua sendo sempre o foco? I mean, it, each game is different. <coughs> and, and sometimes we approach it differently, like with um, Iron Brigade. You know, Brad sure. made that game. And that was an experiment, like, let's just go for the mechanics and build up yes. from that. So you usually don't start just abstract mechanics. We had an abstract mechanic idea he wanted to do. And then when it was all figured out, I came and I wrote a story for it, and I wrote all those cutscenes for it. And that, I feel like that worked too. You know, you could do that too. It just, that game wasn't emphasizing story characters. Like, I don't know if that's what you play. I think you play it more for, you know, the multiplayer uh, sure. mechanics of it. But it, it, was, it was fine to do that way. It was fun to have that challenge of like, here are these, here's a good guy and a bad guy, and figure out why, they, why they're fighting each other. You know, that was a fun challenge. Até agora, nós só falamos do Tim e do processo criativo dele, mas parte do que faz os jogos dele tão interessantes é a equipe que trabalha junto com ele. Tanto na LucasArts quanto na Double Fine, o Tim sempre teve a ajuda de pessoas muito talentosas, desde a direção artística de Peter Chan até as trilhas do Peter McConnell e as habilidades de programação da Anna Kipnis. Mas trabalhar em equipe às vezes significa em ter que convencer os outros a seguir a sua visão, ou ter que deixá-la de lado por um tempo. Saber qual ideia vale a pena lutar por nem sempre é fácil. Well, I mean, I think there's a part of your brain that knows when there's certain things that, that might bother me about a game, like, oh, really, 
it has to be this way. And I feel like I know I, that I'm not able to compromise on that. And if I know those few things, I can let go of almost anything else. So, yeah. And if you, if, you, if you keep it to, like, fewer than 5%, like, it's a 5% of the things that I'm just going to, like, look, I have to, I don't even know if I can explain it to you guys, but I have to, like, I have to have this 5%. And then, like, 15% of stuff that I, or a big chunk of stuff that you can kind of um, negotiate with other people and talk back and forth until you reach a consensus, that stuff... And then there's another chunk where whatever's left is just like, I'm okay with whatever the other people want to come up with, you know. And as long as the stuff you're really putting your foot down is, is a small percentage, and I think that helps you work with other people. Because everybody has that little piece. Yeah, like, and are you leading to with yeah. other people putting their feet down? Yeah, I mean, if it's their area of expertise especially. Like, if they're an artist, they're like, look, you're, this is going to blow the composition if we do it this way. And you might explain, like, well, I need that because I need the player to know there's a door over there, so we have to show the door. And then the artist usually, any craftsperson can usually figure out a solution that will get you what you want. Like, we need the light to shine on the door, so the player needs to go through the door. It's like, well, that will blow the lighting unless we add this other light. To, or, the, or the programmer's like, well, that, that many lights will blow the frame rate, but if we get rid of this other thing, we can afford the light there. And so that's the fun thing about making games. You're all trying to solve this bigger problem together. And as long as you identify not just this is the way I want you to do it but this, here's the goal here's the thing we all want we want the player to go through the door then everybody can get like I have a solution to that I have a solution to figure out a solution that works for everybody nos últimos anos, a Double Fine deixou de investir em produções de grandes orçamentos e passou a focar em jogos menores. Essa decisão resultou no Amnesia Fortnite, que é um evento onde membros da equipe se dividem em outros grupos e criam protótipos dos jogos que elas sempre quiseram criar. Os melhores protótipos do evento são escolhidos para serem os próximos jogos a serem desenvolvidos pela empresa. Antes disso, o Tim era o único diretor de todos os jogos da Double Fine, mas agora ele se vê numa transição para um papel de mentor. Um... I think we're, uh, we've always wanted to have a company that's about creativity. Yes. And I think you can't just have that be one person's creativity, or it's not really about creativity, it's more about yourself. So I think we, we, we started with Demonstration Fortnite is bringing out and nurturing the creativity of the team. And uh, I think it's great that they all get their chance. You know, I think uh, creativity, I think individuality is a big part of creativity, and I think expressing your unique you know, vision of the world is part of that. And so letting other people come to do that, I think, is essential to to who we are, and I'm definitely not trying to make them in my my mold at all. Like I think, no, you know what I mean? No, I mean it's, it's, it's an important thing because I think, like we're talking about with Brad, and making sure that was a, that was a really that was a Brad's game, you know. And I think um, the main thing to me is about making games that you know only the, the game has that personal stamp on it. Whoever made it, I think it should seem like only that person or that group of people could have made it at that time in that place. You know, preventing only could have been made by that team that was working with Lucas in the 90s, you know what I mean, and Full Throttle, just like who we were, what age we were, like I think by being that personal, that's what makes them special and memorable. In some ways by being really specific, they become more universal, and I can't really explain why, but it's just what we've always felt. Entrevistar o Tim Schafer me fez ver os jogos dele de outra forma. Full Throttle e Grim Fandango foram alguns dos primeiros jogos que eu conheci. E essa conversa me fez perceber o quão importante eles foram para moldar o meu gosto. Muitas das características fortes dos jogos do Tim são valores que eu ainda me encontro buscando em outros jogos. Aspectos como mundos diferentes e criativos, saber quando fazer uma piada e saber contar uma história interessante. Sempre há aquela dúvida se o seu herói é quem ele realmente parece ser. Felizmente, ao vivo, o Tim é a mesma pessoa que ele é em frente às câmeras. Ele está sempre brincando e fazendo piadas, sendo gentil e educado com todo mundo. Durante alguns momentos da entrevista, eu até me senti como se eu estivesse conversando com um velho amigo. Ele é uma das pessoas com um dos maiores legados da indústria, e está sempre querendo compartilhar sua experiência com outras pessoas. Mas a maior vontade do Tim é de criar coisas novas, explorar seus interesses, sempre buscando aquela inspiração que vai dar origem a um novo jogo. Então, antes de nos despedirmos, vamos ver o que a Double Fine está produzindo no momento. Ok, hey, Tim, stage is yours. Do your plugins. My plugins? <laughs> hey, uh, Full Throttle Remastered is out on PlayStation and Steam and God right now. There you go. And Psychonauts? It's coming out? Yeah, Psychonauts 2, it's, we're still working on that one. Yeah. Okay, man. But you can watch our um, Music Fortnite videos there on YouTube. We're uh, showing an like, in depth look inside the creative process of our company that's going on right now. It's great. It's great. Thanks so much, Thanks for talking. Bye.